posting online. We do not take any public comment. Um, we do not take any action during these uh, work sessions. This is just for informational purposes and discussion amongst us at the commission. Sarah? Thank you, commissioners. Um, uh, in a minute here, I'll turn it over to Jack and Janice to, to at least do a presentation, but I wanna take this opportunity to welcome our new criminal justice coordinator, Katie Fitzgerald. Uh, this is day nine on the job. Um, really proud to have her and excited to have her expertise here. Um, she's kind of gotten a crash course as uh, helping everybody through this process through get, wrapping up the law enforcement contact study. So welcome, Katie. This is a group you're going to get to know really well, and we're excited to have you on board. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Jack McDivitt, who's been working with us from Northeastern University, and he'll introduce his colleagues, and we'll get started. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah, and thanks, everyone, for taking the time to, to have this conversation about the report. Um, you know, this project started in 2019 uh, when we started uh, having conversations about the fact that uh, there was some interest in having a, a report on whether there were disparities, racial and ethnic disparities in, uh, in uh, the traffic enforcement in Douglas County. So we're uh, gonna show you the results of that um, research and uh, certainly happy to take questions as we go or however you need to do that, it's up to, up to you all. So um, Janice Iwama is a professor at American University and my colleague and we'll uh, go back and forth at this presentation um, talking about the, what we found. So starting with a little bit of back, background, uh, the goals of the study as we originally prepared them were um, to develop and implement a process for documenting traffic and pedestrian stops. I can tell you that um, two things, traffic stops are the number one place where police interact in a formal way with the community. The most co common contact between police and us is having a traffic stop. It's also one that most police departments don't do a lot with. They don't look at the data, they don't try to tabulate it. And so this is something that's uh, a bit unique in, in what Douglas County has done. The second goal was to analyze the data, which we're, we're presenting today to determine if any disproportionalities exist. And the third is to have work together with law enforcement and with the CJCC and you folks to formulate some uh, path pathways to deal with any disparities that we find. So that was the original set of goals. And uh, now it's important to just to stress the fact that uh, most police departments don't collect this data. The ones that do generally do it for two, one of two reasons. One is they've had a high profile incident in the community where somebody is made an allegation of police misconduct in a traffic stop or by state law and mandate. As you know, Missouri has been doing this for a long time and um, they have a state law that requires that they, they do this. Um, in Douglas County, you know, the CJCC, as well as the other county and state reps and the police departments all came in together and said, we'd like to have this information. So it's a, it's, it's a very unusual. It's, and I think it's a real positive statement that they wanted to have this. The other thing I'll say about it that is interesting is that of the five police leaders that were here that made that decision to start it, there's only one left, <laughs> Chief Lovett and uh, Eudora, all the rest. But all the rest have really, uh, led by the sheriff, I would say, have really uh, you know, embraced this and said, this is important, I wanna continue it. So that's, um, that's been a real positive statement. You don't always get that with transition into a pro project like this. So, um, so the, the, as I said, the different phases, um, we did data planning, we collected data for two years, um, it, it, it three, two years and three months, as a matter of fact, we had a little period to make sure that the data was accurate, uh, do the analysis. And then what we're, what we're gonna do, what we're doing this days is to go to each police department, they've seen the report and work with them to say, what do you do with the data? Because one of the things that um, Chief Lockhart would tells us is that in, when he was a chief in Missouri, the data was put up on the Attorney General's website every year, but nobody really had anything to do with it. And so I think to try to understand, okay, well, we have a disparity. Is it something concerning or not? 
is something that uh, you know we are working with the departments to be able to say here's how you would act on that. Um, so go ahead, Dennis. The so here's uh, sort of a little bit more about that decision. So racial profiling is a decision by a police officer or the sheriff's deputy to take an action towards someone based on their race or ethnicity or another characteristic. So it's a decision by, a, by an officer. And we don't, aren't as social scientists, we can't measure that. We can't sort of know what was in somebody's mind. There may be a psychiatrist or psychologist can do that, but we can't. So what we try to do is to say, if there was action like that, what we would do, what we would see is a pattern that would tell us that people were engaged in unconscious or conscious biased decisions. And we can identify the patterns. So if we find a pattern that has, looks like it's a disparity by race or ethnicity, um, you know, we can't automatically tell whether that's legitimate or whether it's racial profiling. So for example, if a neighborhood calls the police and says, we are afraid because the cars are racing up and down the street and the police go to that neighborhood and start pulling people over to get the traffic down. Um, if that neighborhood is an African-American neighborhood, there's gonna be more stops at African-American. And that wouldn't necessarily be racial profiling. It would be you know, responding to the needs of a, of a community. Um, so it's important to, identify the disparities and then to go back to the department and say, is there a reason for this or not? Um, and so, you know, in the best case scenario, which is what you have here in Douglas County, you've got leaders of the local agencies who want to understand this and want to act on it. And so that's where we're working with them. And, you know, this morning we went to the sheriff's office and then we went over to KU PD and we gave them individual officer information because that's where it's actionable. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about why that is, but but if I say to you, there's a stops of African Americans are disproportionate. What do I tell my officers to do? But if I say to you, here's your officers who are doing traffic stops, and these four are stopping African Americans, and these seven are not. Now you can do something. We can do training, we can do, you know, some kind of work with the supervisors to sort of change their behavior, and we can hold them accountable with additional data. So that's sort of the model that we're going in place. And this is the timeline that I mentioned. You know, we started this in 2019. Um, we did some sample data collection through December, September, September to December, three months. So just when you start something new like this, people are confused. They put the wrong things in the wrong buckets. And, and then we started in January, 2020. And as you all remember, in March of 2020, it was COVID and a lockdown. And so the number of stops went dramatically down. Um, and so then we were gonna just do a year, but we had to then extend it because we had you know a few months where there was just very little traffic enforcement. And, we wouldn't have enough stops of people of color to be able to do the measurement. So that's when we extended it. Um, you can, I'll let Janice pick up from here. All right, good afternoon. Um, so in order to identify whether or not there's any evidence of any racial disparities, we decided to use a number of different analytical approaches. Um, for the most part, and I'll try to go over each and every single one of these and have sort of a quick discussion on the limitations. We try to make it clear that there's no one method of, of determining whether or not there's racial disparities. Uh, we will find in the literature that some studies will use the census population. There are a number of limitations in using the census population as a benchmark for one. Uh, individuals who happen to reside in that particular area doesn't necessarily match the people who drive in that particular area. Um, either based on the fact that there's a primary highway that runs from one major city to another that runs through the town. Um, there's different types of patterns and trends in terms of race and ethnicities that drive throughout the day. Um, there's different individuals who have different driving behaviors, for example. Uh, other studies have used observational methods, which is basically where they appoint somebody who gathers data on who's actually driving through. That is both a very expensive and, and, and timely um, way of examining this. Uh, a third fashion would be to look at traffic accident data. Um, there's been a number of studies that have looked at two 
car collisions that have accurately described that the number of people who the distribution of race and ethnicity of drivers who are driving through a particular town happens to match that uh, two no fault car accident in which any individual that's involved in a two car crash who doesn't happen to be at fault, if we were to gather the distribution by race and ethnicity, that would actually almost close to 90 to 95% capture who's actually driving through that particular area. Um, but that is something in our recommendation we encourage them to do. Unfortunately, that was something we could not do in Douglas County. The fourth way of doing this is of course, looking at the residential population. Um, and we'll talk about this and provide a little bit more of information about this um, because that is something we do. So if we were to, for example, gather all those residents in Douglas County who were pulled over, one of the variables in the stop data collection form included whether or not you are a resident of Douglas County. If we happen to capture that number and compare it to those residents using US Census population data based on the driving age, right, limited to the driving age, that might actually be a fairly good comparison at the county level. So we look at that in the next slide. Thank you, Jack. And we'll jump over one more slide. So we look at that in the next slide. Um, when we compare the, the driving population in Douglas County to those residents, particularly who were stopped of all of the stops that actually took place, we find that comparing that about 2.7 times uh, the number of black drivers are stopped of Douglas County residents than of those individuals who happen to live, who happen to be of minimum age, uh, driving age in Douglas County. And that of course involves all of the data across Douglas County. Now, there are of course still a number of limitations with this. Um, for one, one of the things we highlight in the report are the fact that COVID pandemic changed a lot of driving behaviors. Um, it shifted who is actually living those particular towns with so many people moving back, so many people moving around following the COVID-19 pandemic. But this is, of course, one of the four approaches we're using, um, as we'll talk about the other three that help examine and identify whether or not there are racial disparities. There's evidence of racial disparities. Another way of, of trying to examine and estimate whether or not there are is any evidence of racial disparities is through what, what we call multivariate regression analysis. And that is a means of which we try to control for a number of different factors. So for example, a lot of the things we hear is, well, you know, there are a certain number of individuals who happen to be male, um, certain age groups that are, that are more likely to sort of have erratic driving behaviors. Uh, there are certain areas, there are certain um, times throughout the year. Um, so controlling for day of the week, uh, the arrest rates, the crime rates are also going to change um, how police police those particular areas and how therefore they enforce the traffic. So through a multivariate regression analysis, we sort of included about 20 of these variables and we basically try to control for them to try to sort of create an equal plane. And in doing so, we try to examine, well, what is the likelihood of an individual who is a person of color who happens to be stopped across Douglas County and what is the likelihood that they will be cited? And then we ask in a separate model, what is the likelihood that they will be arrested and what is the likelihood that they will be searched? Sort of three areas, three outcomes that really have our significant concern for communities of color. So as you see in this table, when we look at sort of the estimates predicting whether or not a person of color was stopped after controlling for a number of different um, community aspects um, at the local level, we look at citations and arrests and we find it what we, we consider, you know, of course, as statisticians to be non-significant where, where it's actually not a great measure. Um, and the model is able to predict whether or not the person of color is more likely to be cited, more likely to be arrested. However, when we get to searches, um, we find that for the most part that 1.5, um, that persons of color were actually 1.5 times more likely than non-persons of color than white drivers to be searched in Douglas County. And of course, this was an included of discretionary searches. We do very carefully define the difference between discretionary and non-discretionary searches. When we talk about non-discretionary searches, those are searches that are conducted by officers incident to an arrest or as a result of an inventory slash tow. And of course, when we talk about discretionary searches, we talk about searches that are following a consent that was provided by the driver or the passenger, probable cause, or of course, a Terry Frisk that was conducted by the officer themselves. So of course, in this particular instance, sort of trying to control for a number of different variables that, you know, again, based on sort of the literature that we know that are commonly used to target certain types of individuals, we try to create some level of control and try to note that, well, what is more likely to lead for a person of color being cited, arrested, or searched versus a person, a non-person of color or a white driver in this particular instance in Douglas County. 
So the second approach, um, also a multivariate um, regression analysis is, is called the veil of darkness. Um, and we can switch over to that slide. Um, so with the veil of darkness, one of the things that has been argued, of course, is while our previous model tries to control for days of the week, um, people have also argued that there's different driving patterns throughout the day, right? Um, so individuals during the daytime and nighttime are gonna differ based on race and ethnicity. And also, if an officer is looking through a car at the nighttime, he's less likely to identify what, what the color of their skin is versus the daytime where it's more likely for an officer to be able to look through the driver's window, or look through the passenger's window and identify what the color of their skin is. And therefore, based on that assumption, that perception, they're going to make a decision whether or not to cite, arrest, or to search that individual. We try to control for this using what's called a veil of darkness approach, where basically the argument is if we were to try to control for some differences that happen during the nighttime and daytime during what, what is called an intertwilight period, which is basically between 5 p.m. and 9 p.m., right? So we're controlling for a day by focusing on one particular, one particular portion of the day. And then we're controlling for daylight and, 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 and darkness by, by using um, what's basically the Naval Observatory collects information on what's called intertwilight or which is called civil twilight period, which allows us to sort of buy each day throughout the year for 2020 and 2021 capture when the sun is going down sufficiently so that you cannot see. So, so by controlling for that for two years worth of data at, at each daily basis, we're able to capture sort of whether or not an individual was going to be stopped by a police officer during that particular time period um, and whether that person was more likely to be, a, to be a person of color while controlling for, of course, darkness, what we control darkness versus daylight, and of course, controlling for clock time, right, throughout the periods, making sure that, well, not all individuals who drive at 6 p.m. are going to be the same individuals who drive at 8 p.m. And of course, using this, what we call what's called an intertwilight sample, we find that there, there is no um, evidence of, of racial disparities uh, using this particular sample. We even went a step further and of course, just controlled for the number of males. We took out all the females knowing that a larger percentage of men driving happened to be pulled over, which is a fairly um, common national pattern across the US. But we found that even once we control and just looked at the male samples versus a person of color who happens to be a male driver versus a, a white person who happens to be a male driver is more likely to be pulled over um, was in fact not significant and there was no evidence of our racial disparities. So that was one approach that is used. And, and then of course, there's, there's still some limitations with that, but this is of course one of three that we're using now. Um, so the fourth one, so the fourth approach we use is, is what's called post-op analyses. Um, the idea is that if, if we have 10, white drivers who are stopped and we have 10 non-white drivers or 10 persons of color who are stopped, um, the percentage of those individuals who are cited, um, who are searched, or where no evidence is found is going to be similar, um, particularly if we take certain other factors into consideration. So for example, in this instance, we're looking at this information at the agency level, right? We're looking at the percents of, of, of persons of color and the percent of white drivers who happen to be cited. Um, and then we'll go a step further next slide, but let me show you this slide first and in terms of the basis for stop. So in this instance, we find that uh, based on this analysis that for example, Yodora PD, we find that that 1.7 times persons of color are 1.7 times more likely to be cited in Yodora area than they are if they happen to be a white driver, for example, right? We look at, for example, Lawrence PD, and we find that actually persons of color are, are less likely to be cited, so 0.15 less likely to be cited than white drivers in, in Lawrence by Lawrence PD officers in this particular section. We go a step further because one of the comments we've gotten from various community members and various police agencies is, well, you're not focusing on the basis for stop. So in, in the next slide, we started focusing on what are the three primary reasons why police officers are stopping an individual in Douglas County. And this of course matches actually national level data that we find according to the Department of Justice where people are more likely to be stopped for an equipment inspection violation. They're gonna be stopped for speeding 10 miles per hour over the speed limit, or they're gonna be stopped for what we call other traffic violation, which is failing to stop at a stop sign, failing to stop um, at a red light. Um, and those particular three areas seem to make the vast majority of reasons why police officers are pulling somebody over in Douglas County. Um, based on this data, when we start sort of focusing in on just that population who's pulled over for an equipment inspection violation, speeding, or other traffic violation, we start looking at some of the likelihood of person of color being cited versus a white driver. 
So in this particular instance, we sort of go through each individual agencies and I'll focus on, you know, some of the areas that um, we sort of highlighted to the agencies that they should delve into a little bit further. In this particular instance, for example, um, individuals, a sheriff's office is 2.5 times more likely to pull somebody over and cite them for an equipment inspection violation than a white driver, right? So this is comparing again, persons of color to white drivers who happen to be cited for that particular violation. And then of course, when we look at speeding 10 miles per hour over the speed limit, we find that in KU, KU is more likely to cite uh, a person of color for, for speeding 10 miles per hour over the speed limit versus a white driver in that particular area, just focusing on the population that happens to be speeding 10 miles per hour. That's stopped for speeding 10 miles per hour over the speed limit. And then of course, with regards to other traffic violations, we find no positive evidence um, of any type of racial disparities. Um, and this of course includes failing to stop stop sign, red light violations, and a few other things. But for the most part, those are sort of the two primary things that came up with other traffic violations. We also looked at this data when we considered searches. Um, so we broke down the citations and looked at them by violations. And then we focused on searches and of course, discretionary searches in particular, as I discussed earlier. Looking at searches because they are of significant concern to um, so many persons, communities of color. Um, this is something we wanted to highlight. And of course, in looking at the searches, we find that again, there's some evidence of racial disparities um, according to some of the agency level data. In this particular situation, we can see Lawrence and the sheriff having sort of higher ratios, which is basically considering, and just to give you an example, for example, Lawrence is 1.8 times more likely to search a person of color than they are a white driver um, based on the two-year data collection data we've collected over this two-year time period. One of the things with searches I will say, and I think next slide, I don't know if you wanted to go over it, but I can go over it with evidence. So one of the other instances that we find is when an officer conducts a search, right? And this is sort of the feedback we've gotten. It, it's based on this idea that they're likely to find evidence and then follow up with either an arrest or a citation. Um, there's been a certain percentage of cases where there is no evidence found, right? And this of course could be based on the fact that they smelled marijuana and then didn't find something and let somebody go um, due to actual legitimate reasons, or there's always a concern for an illegitimate reason. And that's sort of what we encourage agencies to really look at a lot, a lot further into, um, particularly now that they have this type of data that they can use. Um, so in this particular instance, we focused on not only discretionary searches, whether or not a person of color was more likely to um, experience a discretionary search. Uh, we also looked at cases where there was no evidence found. So in this particular case of those individuals who were searched, who happened to be persons of color or white drivers, uh, what percent were those of cases where no evidence was found, right? And looking particularly at the persons of color and of course of white drivers. And then this particular case, for example, again, we you know looked at each agency levels, Baldwin, Eudora and KUPD simply did not conduct enough searches during the two year study period. Um, we can encourage them to continue collecting this data, but the sample was so small that there was no significant finding from this. But looking at the sheriff's data, for example, in this particular instance, persons of color were 1.3 times more likely to be searched with no evidence found than white drivers, right? And so again, this, this is four different ways, four different areas of, of approaching the data and looking at it. And, and, and this is something that as, as we've noted, some particular instances show very similar patterns across the board. And that is something that sort of we focus and, and sort of put towards agencies to sort of start examining and dig in a little bit deeper. Um, one of the things that we were unfortunately able to do, and we highlight this in our in our report that's going to be coming out, is of course looking at um, officer level characteristics, right? Some officers are more likely to issue citations versus others, and trying to dig a little bit deeper at some of those officer level characteristics, which some of the scholarly literature highlights, might provide some evidence of why individuals are more likely to be cited, arrested, or searched, and or searched um, when they have to be persons of color for, versus non persons of color. So. Shoot it back over to my colleague, Jack McDevitt. I don't like following Janice, she's too good. Um, so, so this is just a summary of all of that. And basically what, what we are telling the police departments is, um, unfortunately for that first disparity that we talked about, that African-Americans or blacks were being stopped more often, um, since we didn't collect information on the residence of the driver, all we knew was Douglas County versus other counties. 
we can't tell which agency might be doing that and which agency isn't. So we're encouraging every agency to look into that because we, we can't tell. And as you'll see, one of the recommendations is to sort of collect that data moving forward. There we have now, as you go through, we didn't find evidence of racial profiling in the veil of darkness approach. We didn't find it in the multivariate approach for citations and arrests. So, you know, the, the summary of this is that we didn't find widespread racial profiling in Douglas County by any agency. What we did find was pockets of disparities that need some more analysis and some looking into. Um, and we found that at the equipment violation, at speeding, and in almost all cases, at searches. And the searches are just, uh, as Janice was saying, they're pretty much what we find in every study that's been done across the country, is that police officers tend to believe that people of color are more likely to be involved in drug dealing or something that's contraband, and they have a lower threshold to make a decision to search. Um, it's interesting when I do training of police officers, when I say to them, you know, the national data on drug use says that the proportion of whites who use drugs is greater than the proportion of non-whites. And they all go, no, that can't be true. Because <laughs> they're just in their heads. It's a lot of, this is all, you know, what happens. So, so that's, um, that's one of the things that, uh, that um, you know, is, is something that's going to need some work. So um, we have a series of recommendations. And we would love to hear from this group additional recommendations that you'd like to see in the report. Um, from Sarah's point of view, we've been talking to the police departments and they, the ones we've spoke to so far are perfectly comfortable with a 90 day report back to the CJCC on what they're doing to address these disparities. They're all committed to address them. So I think that that, you know, can be enhanced that recommendation. So our first recommendation is that continue the data collection. We, we may do some other things like training and, and that, but if we stop the data collection, um, it, we're not gonna be able to see whether or not the disparities are going down. You know, they should come back, to, you should come back to this body and others to say, you know, we're making progress or we're not. And, you know, see, this is the steps we're taking. They can learn from each other. One might take a step that's working and the other one might, might say, oh, I haven't done that. I'll try that next. So uh, that's the, that's one of the things that we're recommending. And I know you folks have been working with agencies on to make sure that they committed to it. And they're make, saying that to us now, you know, they're, in each of our meetings, they're saying, we're, we're gonna keep using this data. And uh, I know Matt is gonna be uh, developing a uh, data dashboard that can be, you can see all the data transparently and, and as it does. The second recommendation is that this is a good period to see if, the data that's being collected needs to be tweaked. So like I said, including the residents is important. And then we can know where, what communities are involved in stopping African-Americans and Blacks. Um, the the um, other things that are being considered are the sheriff believes that the distinction of 10 miles an hour, more than 10 miles for speeding and less than 10 miles is not refined enough. So he was thinking of doing something more like at five mile increments. So it's five miles over, 10 miles over, 15 miles over, and then, you know, uh, more than 15 miles over. Because he said that some people will make a distinction and some officers make a distinction around 15, some of the 10. So this allows them to, to know that. I think that was also too, because in the unincorporated area where speed limits are higher, you know, there's, it's a little, there's a little bit more disparity or and when you're going to pull somebody over for a citation when your speed limits are a little higher. Thank you. So then uh, the third set um, is what, what we've been doing here, which is to give the data on the officer level to the agencies and say, this is the offices. It's called internal benchmarking. You compare officers who work the same shift or the same area of town to each other and see if we have an outlier, one officer that's you know, doing di different kind of policing. Um, you know, just to give you an example, in one of the agencies we talked to this morning, they said, we showed them the officers who were doing more searches and the, they immediately said, that's the officer with the dog. And that would be what you would expect. The, the, the officer with the dog is probably gonna do more searches than the officer who's just 
you know, looking for the smell of marijuana or something like that. So it, it's, it, it's either um, telling, it's a management tool for the departments as well. You know, which officers are being more active, which officers are being less active, are they doing what we expected them to be doing? So I think it, it gives them some more information to help manage their organization. Um, and then, um, so looking at um, the reasons for the stop in, with, at the officer level, and then um, follow-up analyses on where they've been found. You know, are they found in a certain section of the city uh, or a town? Are they found on a certain highway? You know, where is that happening? So you can communicate that back to your officers that here's where we're seeing some problems and we want you to pay attention to that. And then the, um, the final two are um, that it doesn't do anybody any good for the police to do this and keep it to themselves. So they need to report back to the public group, the CJCC, uh, maybe Human Rights Commission in, a, in an area, maybe another group that's interested in this issue and to give that information back. Here's what we're doing. Here's what we're seeing the data. You know, you're going to have a whole another year. Matt will have all of 2022 data that can be added and you can see sort of changes over time and that. So I think that's, but, but sharing it. And, and what Janice and I work with hundreds of police departments and what seems to be the case is for most people, there are some people that hate the police no matter what they do. And there's some people who love the police no matter what they do. But for most people, knowing the police are looking at it and doing in good faith, trying to see whether or not there's a problem with some of their officers is a really important thing. And that goes a long way to developing trust. The final one is, is, is something that um, came up in conversations. And I would just say that as far as we're concerned this may or may not be helpful, but around 120 agencies across the country have started a program where um, they um, look at, uh, go to the local businesses in town and say, could you contribute so that when we pull someone over for an equipment violation, we can give them a voucher that would help pay for that, as opposed to a, a citation that costs them extra money it is a $50 voucher that you can redeem at a local gas, you know, auto repair shop to have your headlight fixed or your taillight fixed. And in the places that are doing it, they're seeing a real positive increase in trust because, you know, the community is saying, hey, this is not bad. We're, we're getting an opportunity to, the police are giving us a chance to fix this thing um, and help with that. Now, there's some questions about how that's done and how it's monitored and, and that, and we, we can, you know, certainly talk about that. But that's one of the things that, that we have um, we had recommended. Um, the, the only other one that um, you know, we, we were, have been kicking around and is that there may be a more formal reporting back process that comes. And that's why I was mentioning when we talked to the agency today, they all thought 90 days was, not, was a good one to come back and say, here's what we've done so far, here's where we think we'll be going next. And to come to the, any groups you want but the CJCC or other groups, and they, they seem entirely helpful. Most of them that we've talked to have already started to do some of these things, started to look for training uh, for officers, started to monitor the, there's some officers' behavior. Um, so th this is already starting, which is what we would hope. So that's pretty much where we are. Come on down, Jim. <laughs> and we're happy to answer any questions that you have. Great, thank you so much, Jack and Janice. <clears throat> we appreciate you um, reiterating this. For, we know you're on a bit of a tour of presentations this week while you're with us. So um, thank you for that overview. I, I'll just, I don't have any questions top of mind. Um, so I wanna check with fellow commissioners and see if there's any clarifying questions or anything they kinda of wanna jump into. Yeah. Um Mr. Commissioner Kelly, if it's okay, I'm just interested to hear you work with a lot of police departments on this and you talked about 90 days and my aspiration is once we look at the data, we start to make some changes and move in a more positive direction. Is that what you see in other communities? Is there, I'm not looking for maybe a prediction of what we might see, but I'm just interested in hearing. Um, yeah, so yeah. one of the things we've noticed is is obviously, and, and this is why we've sort of been engaging in these discussions with all the police agencies, right? Sort of giving them a, a feedback and, and our own personal insight at each individual level agencies. 
for the most part, agencies are eager to, to move forward with it, right? If this is coming from Douglas County, which had no data collection system to all of a sudden having data collection, right? In order to look at not only measures on, on evidence of racial disparities, but also officer productivity, right? And, and this is to get a better understanding of what type of behaviors or what actions are their officers engaging in and, and how impactful is it having on, for example, traffic accidents, reducing fatalities, right? And so this is not only useful for them in, in, in one aspect of measuring whether or not there are racial disparities, but in 10 different ways. And most of the agencies are aware of that and, and they're happy to have that. Um, I think the nice thing is, you know, coming from, you know, Boston, Massachusetts um, and in DC metropolitan area is we've had an opportunity to engage with these discussions in, in agencies that are eager to have the data, figure out what they can do with it. Now, that's not to say that they put in one measure in place and it's going to have the positive effect. That, that's actually something that we've been talking about to them a lot. It's trying. One thing, it doesn't work measuring if it was effective moving on to the next. I think having an opportunity to examine and analyze this data in sort of one or, or all of the methods you know, we've sort of used allows them this, this other way of trying to figure out, well, if we put one type of activity, one type of programming, or reduce the number of officers that happen to be in this particular area, are we actually creating the right effect that we want? Um, so I will say for most of the agencies that we've worked on, very few agencies have ever said, no, we're shutting down, we're not doing this again. Um, their officers have already been doing this for two years. So I don't see agencies taking a step back. I rather just see them moving forward. How quickly and how quickly that they move forward um, is sort of up to them. But I will say at least as long as the leadership continues where it is now, we've received nothing but positive feedback and in agencies that we've worked on that have maintained and sustained that leadership and support have always moved forward with this data as, as you know, a positive thing. And just to follow up, one of the things that is also, we have had agencies say no, you know, and generally what they do is they fight about the data. You know, the data is not accurate. You know, we don't believe it. It's not, the analysis isn't, isn't what, um, what we wanted. Uh, or they'll say, you know, there is nothing there. You know, even though we've seen disparities, they're all fine, and they're, let's just stop this. Um, one of the things that Janice said, that's the biggest problem is if you stop data collection, getting your offices to start it again is so difficult. Now, it takes them a minute to two minutes to fill out the form. You know, that's how long it takes. It's just part of doing their job. But once, once they say, oh, you stopped it, trying to get them to restart it is really difficult. So I, the, I'm really glad to hear that um, you've had such positive feedback across the county from all the agencies. And I think you know, that really speaks um, to some um, good relationship building that has happened over the years through CJCC. And I appreciate that that um, has remained true through transition. So, and I'm also really glad to hear that everybody expects to kind of report back to CJCC as an immediate next step about kind of what they're doing with this data and stuff. Do you have a recommendation about, I mean, I know you just kind of talked about how it's up to agencies to determine how fast they move forward, but, you know, and based on your experience, do you have recommendations for sort of a, a benchmark of time to come back and revisit some of that data and analyze again whether or not there's been any noticeable differences, how frequently um, analysis of any policy or practice changes should happen um, to, to try and determine whether or not it's moving the needle or not making a difference. And to your point, Janice, trying something different. Does that question make sense? <laughs> Absolutely. It did. I, I'd say that it's a minimum to, to be able to see it in the data. Now, agencies should be reporting back on what they're doing. You know, we've, you know, we've identified two officers that we think were maybe unconscious bias and we're having them go to training. Uh, those are fine to do at the 90 day, three month period, but you're gonna need a minimum of six months of data and it's probably gonna be more like a year because, you know, 70% of the stops are white folks. So to accumulate enough stops of people of color to be able to have statistically significant analysis you really have to accumulate those over time. And, you know, going back to, and that's hoping that you don't have, we don't have any more COVIDs <laughs> you know, where everything stops. 
Yeah, I, I would have to agree. I would say looking at, for example, so I will be clear, the data we collected was from January 1st of 2020 to December 31st of 2021. Looking at data from the end of 2022 would be a good opportunity to have a year's worth of data. And the reason why we say that is because there are seasonal patterns and drivers. Um, so particularly with Lawrence, when we talk about the impact that KU has with students coming in during the first four months, it being quiet during the summer and then coming back in, we're going to see different patterns and driving behaviors across races. And it's nice to have the full 12 months, which is why we were aiming for a year. COVID happened, as Jack said, unless something like COVID, which we wouldn't have predicted back in 2019 happening, having an impact, such, such a huge impact on traffic activity. But about a year's worth of data would be where agencies should look back at and see where or not there's measurable difference, right? Because at that point, you have a full 12 months worth of data. And, you know, knock on wood, unless something like COVID-19 happens, we kind of have a better understanding on whether or not it has effectively reduced and not outside of not affected by any other type of um, activity or events. Yeah. And one thing I, I would say that the beginning of the report just describes the, the data in Douglas County. And, and there's two things there that are, I think are really positive and can build off, but also be a platform to talk to the community about, which is that Douglas County agencies, all of them, are much more likely to give a warning than the national average. You know, they see that that's a financial burden on individuals to give you a citation. And so, uh, as one officer was saying to us, you know, it's only if we've seen that the person has been stopped multiple times and they're still violating that we think that's a good time to give them a citation because the, whatever we're doing with giving them a warning isn't changing the behavior. Um, so, you know, I, but I think that the community should know that, you know, 60 plus percent of the stops result in a warning on the national average is more around 40%. So that's one thing. The other thing that's that's really positive is for all the agencies here, their searches are much more productive. And as Janice said, one of the things that's really maddening to a community member is that be pulled over, be searched, you don't have anything, there's no, and the police officer doesn't have, doesn't find anything. And you just get sent along your way. That you go home and you tell all your friends and your family, you know, I just got stopped. And the only reason I was stopped was because I'm black or Latino or whatever. And so those kind of stops are really negative. But in Douglas County, you know, Lawrence has about a 60% of their stops. So they find something. The national average is 25. You know, so being able to continue to move in that direction. And I think what all of the officers have told us is that there are some officers that are better at it than others. It's like anything. And maybe we could do some self-training where the officers who are really good at it are able to talk to the office about they, what they are looking for when they open, when they're looking in a car and deciding to make a search. And so that they can help each other learn that. And we've talked to the agencies about doing that. And so I think there's some positive things that as part of the education of the community would be nice to the community to be able to hear. Any other questions from commissioners at this time? Yeah, yeah, I'm glad you brought up the verbal and written warning because there were some numbers that jumped out at me in the report. You know, in some communities, it's much higher than in other communities. And I, I'm just interested, I mean, I, I was glad that you talked about it because I guess I hadn't perceived, I was maybe perceiving it as, you know, if we are stopping people and, and we're, I mean, a good way of thinking about it is we gave them a verbal warning and we moved on. A, a, maybe a negative way of thinking about it is we were harassing them, right, in that stop. I mean, it's just another way to think about it. So I was sort of interested in what the conversation was with the law enforcement departments about some of those disparities from community to community. And then we'll maybe answer that question and then I'll follow it up with another. Well, what they, the community, what the law enforcement, in Douglas County seem to tell us is that they're very aware of the financial burden of a citation yeah. and that they don't want, like one, one, uh, one of the agencies told us, we don't want citations in equipment violations. We, we, we want a warning in equipment violation, tell them to go get it fixed. Uh, we don't want to increase the burden on it. So I think there's a, an awareness of the costs involved here that is different than um, but there's other thing, um, we, we had an occasion in Boston where um, in one section of the city, everybody 
uh, we had 90% of the stops result in a citation. And that was the African-American section. Right next door, South Boston, which is a more white section, Virginia, uh, they, uh, it was almost 80% got a warning right next to each other. And we're like, oh my God, this is unbelievable racial profiling. The black community is getting all citations and the white community is getting all warnings. But it wasn't. What it was, was the district commander in each of those districts had different philosophies about what you should do. One said, if you stop them, you write them. I don't want warnings. And the other was saying, I think warnings are just as effective as citations. So, you know, what Boston did was ended up switching the two <laughs> leaders and so, but, but they didn't know what was even happening because until they had the data, they didn't know that this was th such a huge difference was how they were policing those two areas of the city. So I, I do think that, that having that conversation is right, but I think also trying to, as Jan said, dealing with the data, you know, if you do have the person's driving history in front of you as you're making the decision, there may be a point in time where you do have to make sure you switch over to a citation because it is the message isn't getting there. So those are all part of that conversation. And there seems to be a, a an awareness here that isn't the same as around the country. And then just a little bit of my follow up would be about you know you, you've mentioned a lot in our discussion today about how we compare to other communities and. There's a little bit of that in the report. Is there a reason not to include? I mean, I think I think sometimes I don't want to give the impression that Lawrence is not striving for an aspiration, but sometimes out of context, it looks like we're um, we're way behind the curve or things like that. And and just is your experience that including that data doesn't um, encourage you to be more aspirational or? including sort of some comparative data. So sorry, we um, included some of the national level data in order to set sort of a background. Again, as, as we talked to a lot of the agencies, I mean, there's 18,000 law enforcement agencies and they all train their officers differently. They all run their agencies differently. And, and even the five agencies that we spoke to, they all also run their agencies differently in how they collect their data. I think our hope is when we look at some of the general patterns in terms of what types of violations are people being pulled over? Um, what percent are being searched? What percent are being contraband found? We provide a national level aspect for agencies to get a better understanding, realizing that the best way to compare would be a similar population, right? Would be a, a, another county with the same population, same size, same demographics in Kansas that is also dealing with similar state statutes, right? And, and that would be an ideal measure. Unfortunately, unlike Missouri, Kansas state doesn't require to collect, you know, right, right? We have so many states um, now that collected and have been collecting data for years that are able to sort of compare and contrast. Um, we weren't able to find a county that collects your level of data. So on the one hand, Douglas County is leading that effort and sort of making sure here are traffic stop data, we're collecting race and ethnicity in order to accurately measure who is actually being pulled over and who's being cited and who's being warned. And so I, I will say that would be my hope and that, that might be something that can absolutely be done in the future, but trying to paint the picture with the national level characteristics are very difficult, mostly because national level characteristics are also based on a sample of agencies, right? It's not the full picture, um, similar to the census, it's just not actually capturing some of the nuances with different agencies, just those that are actually reporting. We did that to sort of allow agencies to get a better understanding on, well, why are other people stopping? We see similarities on um, why are, what is the percentage of people searching? We see similarities, the citations and warnings as Jack just noted, and we note in our report, more people across the country tend to cite than they, they tend to issue warnings. That is to say with, you know, and that was sort of my other note now that I'm thinking of that footnote, um, for example, in Massachusetts state, they do, do not record verbal warnings. So we do. So we are capturing the full pictures when I stop you or you, and I'm giving you a verbal warning, I'm writing a note down that I stop you. A lot of agencies aren't doing that. If I give you a verbal warning that there's no written record of that, right? And so because of that, we're actually able to capture the activities of what officers are doing when they're out on the streets enforcing traffic laws. So it, with that in mind, that's not being captured by all state, you know? So that's sort of one of their footnotes and that we're aware of just sort of based on our understanding with other agencies and how they're capturing that information. This is- it, 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 um, Your question is really subtle and I really appreciate it. You know, is, is, is the idea that they're doing some of these things that are above the average gonna make them sit back on their laurels and say, you know, we're, we're the best. Um, I, I think that the fact that 
there are disparities is being seen by the chiefs as a failure. Um, I think they all think that it's something that they don't want to have happen. As one leader said to us, if I have any disparities, I got to figure out a way to get rid of them. Um, so I think that that's a piece of it. I think also we had a public meeting with the Lawrence City Commission the other night. And there weren't a lot of people praising the police that night. You know, there are some people here who, you know, have some pretty negative feelings about the police. And, and I'm not shy about sharing that. So I, I think they, they, they don't think they're the best. Uh, but, but it is something that, that, you know, the fact that they can get in a dialogue with different groups in their community is probably something that will continue to um, benefit both parties. Commissioner Portillo, I, I really appreciate the questions and kind of the response around data and comparisons within the state. Um, we did in the Commission for Racial Equity and Justice did ask the state to require the same type of statute that Missouri has, start collecting data statewide. We haven't gotten much traction with our current legislature, but something to continue to push for once we're in session again in January. So it would be really helpful to be able to compare to other communities within the state. Um, the other piece of data, one thing that I think is really great about this study is that we have five agencies across the county. But as you mentioned, we have five agencies across the county. And so as we look at moving forward and next steps, I know that some of those agencies are really excited to change some of the data collection, like you mentioned with the sheriff's office, going to those five mile increments on speed. I do wanna make sure that we're providing the kind of space for the agencies to get together so that when they're changing their data collection, they're changing it in unison so that we can still have comparisons. So we want it to be something that they can each use individually, but we can still use at a community level because we do have five agencies that are participating. And I know that Matt is gonna be on top of it. Thank you, Dr. Cravens, for all the work that you're gonna to continue to do, but just something for us to keep in mind as a community. And we've been stressing that too that uh, in each of our meetings with the police department and said, you know, we were talking to KU, they have some different issues at KU. And for there, it might be important for them to know, like, is this in a parking lot? But it's the kind of thing that everybody should do it. You know, maybe it won't happen in Lawrence and they won't be a lot, but, but the form should stay the same. It, it will make Matt's life so much more difficult if there's five different forms, but better than that, if the, somebody start, if the, if the agencies are collecting different things, people are going to ask in their community, well, what about speeding over in Eudora? And there won't be any data there. And it may look like people are hesitating to collect it or whatever. So I, I do think it's important that all of us send the message that, yes, it's, it's a time to take a look at it, but we should still continue with the uniform data collection across all the agencies. You know? Well, if we're getting close to wrapping up, I just wanted to take this opportunity to really thank Jack and Janice for all their continued work over the last several years uh, on this. And then also, you know, I, we, Robert Benecki, I saw is on the Zoom and he was our first criminal justice coordinator when this project got started. And Dr. Cravens has been mentioned, Mike Brower. Um, you know, so just, it's this has definitely been a team effort. There's been a lot of work behind it. This has been a, a long process and we really thank you know, you all for sticking with us and, um, you know, and just some of the struggles that we've gone through to get here to this point, but it's, it's exciting to have this wrapped up and move on to the next phase. Thank you. It's been a, it's, there's some, it's been a really good project for Janice and I, because everybody's been acting in good faith. You know, the community is acting in good faith. The departments are acting in good faith and, you know, it's a hard issue. You know, and, and one of the one of the recommendations that may be putting in is is a, something like one of the hardest things to do is to help supervisors know how to deal with this issue. You know, supervisors are perfectly com com comfortable, easy for me to say, um, with the saying to somebody, you know, you've taken the last three Fridays off, knock it off. I need you here to be on Friday. You know, but to say you're stopping more people of color than you're stopping white folks, or you're searching more people of color. That's a hard conversation. And there are some good trainings out there to help supervisors have those kinds of conversations. And I think that's something that, because in policing, it's not the chief, it's your supervisor that has the biggest bearing on what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. So preparing the supervisors to be able to be in the position 
to be able to have those conversations with officers is something that I think is really helpful and, and, and it, we're not there yet. Yeah, I will say, you know, sort of highlighting Sarah's point, this absolutely has been a collaborative effort of over three years from all the agencies. Um, nothing is worse than, you know, what Chuck and I have done, which is walk into an agency and try to do a study with a consent decree over top of them and that we've done before. And, and, and I will say, and so this at least has been completely open doors. All agencies have been willing to talk to us, talk about data collection, talk about the challenges, talk about what can they do to move forward with officer level analysis, as Jack said, sort of comparing officers. And this, this has absolutely been a very productive conversation up until now. So we look forward to hearing this. Like we said, and we say this in the report, this is the first step, not the last, right? To sort of begin and continue sort of data-driven policing in this instance. So we look forward to hearing more. Thank you both so much. I really um, appreciate this presentation and conversation. And um, it's always good to hear it highlighted about our community, how collaborative and um, open and willing uh, we are to have tough conversations and figure out what's uh, where we've been, where we're at and where we can go with it, with good information and good conversation. I also really appreciate the approach of in addition to that collaborative nature that was um, that sounds like it made this process um, so successful and gave us good information, uh, the time and attention that you all are giving to each of the individual agencies and being able to help um, each of them within their own policies and practices um, and officer culture kind of zero in on some of the that nuanced data. So I really appreciate that approach and I think that um, we and the CJCC um, can continue to be a space to encourage those conversations amongst leadership, which trickles down um, into really important training and um, some culture change moving forward. So thank you all for your time. Have a good rest of your evening with that. We will go ahead and recess until our 530 business meeting.